key message is really that we have the dramatic evidence that science is now, so to say, stepping out of its comfort zone, reacting on its own evidence, because we have now ample observational proof that we've gone very recently, just over the past 30 years, from being a relatively small world on a big planet, where we've been able to build up an economic logic and a model in society that has allowed itself essentially to exploit the commons without invoices being sent back from the planetary Earth system. And since the last 30 years, we've flipped over to now be a relatively large world on a small planet. And this journey actually starts very significantly with James Watts and the invention of the coal-fired steam engine in 1750. And this little film here gives you the journey of humanity over the last 150 years. On the y-axis you have the planetary boundaries, the different pressures of humanity, and it starts off 1771 with the steam engine. The United Kingdom starts off its mechanical industrial revolution. Starts also the infrastructure expansion around the world, and very rapidly we are connected through railway and different trading schemes around the planet. And we're coming in the late 19th century to the point where Fleming invents antibiotics, and we start really longing uh, life expectancies. We invent the Haber-Bosch process in 1920, allowing us for modern nitrogen fertilizer and the rapid expansion of agriculture. And then we come 10 years after the Second World War to this famous great acceleration point, 1955, three and a half billion people, and suddenly we veer off from the linear incremental pressures on planet Earth to the exponential rise on every Earth system parameter that regulates human well-being, from carbon dioxide, biodiversity loss, nitrous oxide. And then we start off in a point, and we come to 1968, and as you all know, Rachel Carson warns us with Silent Spring that, dear friends, if we continue, we might undermine the life support systems on Earth. And Club of Rome comes right after and says that by 2020, GDP will fall down because we might be moving in the wrong direction. But they had very little evidence, as you see. It was just a speculation, an early warning from insightful people who really warned humanity. And then we come to the mid-1980s, and science for the first time sees the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer. Policy listens. Nobody has ever seen an ozone whole, but we trust science and innovations and industry are in place, and we implement the Montreal Protocol, veering away from one of the boundaries back to safe operating space. But look at the graph. We continue on the hockey stick patterns, and now we are in 2007, 2009. We are recognizing the need for sustainable development goals. We publish the planetary boundary science, but we continue on this unsustainable journey right up to the top of exponential curves, and we are, science is really clear, at a saturation point. We have filled up the entire small planet with world pressures, and for the first time, we're starting to really, really map out invoices being sent back from a remarkably resilient Earth system, which actually, on balance, only applies negative feedbacks, meaning it's dampening our views. It's like standing there in a boxing ring, getting punch after punch, but still standing. And it's still standing today, but clearly it's more vulnerable than ever, and it's our commons that are paying the price. And this is why science now steps out of its comfort zone and feels it's ready to tip over into a global sustainable journey, where we depend on exactly these functions of the large commons that regulates the planet. Welcome to the Anthropocene. This is the geological epoch where we as Anthros, 7.2 billion people, are now the dominant force of change on planet Earth. It's not models, it's not hypothesis, it's empirical evidence. Second insight, which now changes really our thinking around global commons, and I just want to remind everyone that this is how global commons has been perceived over the last 50 years, as being the resource domains that lie outside of political reach of any one nation state incorporating the four systems, the high seas, the atmosphere, Antarctica, and outer space, but importantly, guided by the principle of the common heritage of humankind. What we scientifically think that now, through the Anthropocene evidence, we need to adapt the global commons, raising their importance, and actually going beyond the systems outside of nation borders to incorporate all the systems that regulates the Earth system stability. There is also, outside of science, a much, much stronger recognition that we are in the Anthropocene. You probably follow that through media and different uh, 
very important kind of signaling systems around to business and policy. I think this is now established that we are a dominant force on small planet Earth. Even Pope Francis is absolutely clear about the fact that being in the Anthropocene, we are now threatening the stability of creation, planet Earth, which requires rethinking and really taking up the global commons to a new level. Insight two, though, is that if we are now punching planet Earth, still applying its biogeophysical systems to apply maximum resilience and kind of helping us as a, as a best friend, what's the risk that Earth tends, turns into a foe? What are the Earth system tipping point risks? And here we have a lot of evidence today advancing over just the last 20 years of different large systems on Earth that are risk of crossing tipping points and irreversibly and abruptly changing a state from a desirable supporting humanity to an undesirable state. From the dieback of the Amazon to the large Amund Sea glacier system in Antarctica to the Arctic sea ice across biomes, across systems. And this in turn shows us one new insight that everything we've assumed of efficiency and optimization and linear incremental change does not apply. Surprise is rather the universal behavior of the Earth system, but it has resilience to take uh, <coughs> exploitation over long periods of time and can then shift over abruptly to nonlinear changes. And that's why we get nervous when we have this kind of evidence of 2,000 years of very narrow temperature variability on Earth between plus minus one degree Celsius and the fact that we are now moving very rapidly outside of even the widest range of variability over the past actually 12,000 years since the last ice age and that even if we would implement the INDCs in Paris, we know we would reach three degrees Celsius global average temperature warming, which would be a point we haven't been for the last five, six million years. Now, the drama is though even more acute than that because if we load the temperature rise with nonlinear changes, it looks even more challenging for humanity and the recognition why global commons are so important. So here you have the last 20,000 years on the y-axis temperature variability, average temperature on Earth. We have the Pleistocene Ice Age and we exit the Ice Age 12,000 years ago and we enter the extraordinarily stable Holocene period you see here along the zero line. Here you have the Paris Agreement which is to stay as far under two as possible and aim for one and a half degrees Celsius. Here you have the IPCC RCP family and as you know we're following a pathway that uh, if we implement the INDCs, we're probably veering towards RCP 6, but we're actually following an RCP 8.5 path. And here you have for the first time, if you combine this analysis with Earth system tipping points. And what you then find is a very dramatic message for humanity that science now indicates that there's a whole family of Earth tipping points that are inside the Paris framework meaning that we can no longer exclude that even if we would successfully deliver on Paris, we would still risk the coral reefs on planet Earth. We're still at risk of the alpine glaciers. The, the range here, by the way, is the uncertainty range, the standard deviation in science, which shows that for coral reefs, even within the standard deviation, we are under two degrees Celsius. You see the Arctic summer sea ice here, which is at an uncertainty range inside Paris. Peter Schlosser is here who led a very important synthesis just for the Arctic Science Minister at the White House just one week back, showing that if we get two degrees Celsius on planet Earth, we will get five degrees Celsius in the Arctic, which is just a reminder of the amplification effects for these large regulating biomes. Greenland, a drama in itself, seven meter sea level rise inherently, which could be on an on push button at two degrees Celsius irreversibly leading to ice melt. So this is a reminder of the need to be precautionary, to apply not only universality around the SDGs and the commons, but also to apply careful, resilient thinking and to avoid coming too close to these kind of thresholds. That's our insight too then. Tipping points are an integral part of the Earth system. And finally, the third uh, insight is that can we as scientists today define the desired state of the planet to support humanity in the future? And the answer is yes. And the question is posed in a very provocative way. Are we actually at risk of leaving the Garden of Eden, an oasis state that has supported humanity so far? And ice core data actually supports our ability to be able to convey to humanity 
what is the desired state of planet Earth to support the delivery of SDGs and our aspirations as humanity? This is 100,000 years of evolution. It's ice core data from the northern hemisphere. On the y-axis is temperature variability, a good proxy of how it was to live on Earth. And as you may know, during most of this period, it was a very jumpy ride indeed for humanity. We were just a few million people, we were hunters and gatherers, and we had a very rough time. Temperature could actually vary by plus minus 10 degrees Celsius over a decade. We were so rough in this period that you see this cold point at 75,000 years. We were, according to the latest paleoclimatic data, down at less than 15,000 fertile adults on Earth at that cold point. We were hiding in the Ethiopian highlands, the only place there was fresh water and biomass to live of, and that was a point where we basically were extinct. We exit the last ice age and we enter the Holocene. And you can just look at this slide to recognize what Pope Francis points out. It's essentially a miraculous period. It is an extraordinarily stable phase of plus minus one degree Celsius. And even though the genetic diversity has been around on planet Earth for 100 million years, everything we cherish, everything we depend on, everything we love settles in the Holocene. And rainy seasons become so predictable that we barely enter the Holocene and we invent agriculture. We go from hunters and gatherers to become domesticating farmers and we start the modern societal de development as we know it. And this is why science, third message in my mind is the most important one, that the Holocene is the only state of the planet we know for certain can support the modern world as we know it. We can live outside of the Holocene, but we cannot think of ethically taking responsibility for 9.5 billion co-citizens outside of the Holocene. So this leads to this dramatic equation, so to say, which is the last 20 years of Earth system scientific advancement, that we are in the Anthropocene, plus the insight that we depend on the interglacial stable state, the Holocene, plus that tipping points are real, equals the need to scientifically define a safe operating space between within planetary boundaries, which led to the planetary boundary analysis, which identifies the large Earth regulating systems that we depend on to regulate the state of the planet, which of course is not only climate, but also includes biodiversity, land systems, fresh water, and the other two large cycles from carbon, namely nitrogen and phosphorus. It also includes oceans, the stratospheric ozone layer, but also we believe from scientific evidence aerosols that control, for example, the monsoon systems, but also novel entities, the risk of us accumulating through cocktail effects, risks of changing our chemical composition and, and having genetic impacts. Quantifying this scientifically is today possible for seven of the nine, which is a good message for humanity. We can actually define a biophysical safe operating space in green, but in yellow we have the uncertainty range, and in red we are in a danger zone, we estimate today for biodiversity, nitrogen, phosphorus, land, and climate. This allows us also to do something really important in guiding global commons in the future, because it gives us a kind of a, a roadmap for the future. This is where we were in 1750. We were right at the center and not touching the safe operating space. We were really a small world on a big planet. 1950, the Habibosch process has come so far, so modern agriculture had actually taken us out into the mass extinction of biodiversity already through expansion of agriculture. 1970, well, Rachel Carson warns us in the Club of Rome, we're still safely inside the green uh, space of the safe operating space, but look now what happens when we boom out to 1990. This is the point where we hit the saturation point. We are outside on the stratospheric ozone layer. The modern agricultural systems has really eutrophied large parts of our waterways. And this is the point where you could say we flip over from the small world on a big planet to a big world on a small planet once and for all. But look at what happens here from then to now. Science reports the threat to the ozone layer. Policy really acts on the Montreal Protocol. And today, we're back inside the safe operating space on depleting the stratospheric ozone layer. We have success. We have at one time been planetary stewards of a common and taken us back into a safe operating space, which can be a good inspirational guide for getting the entire planetary boundary family inside the safe operating space. So how does this then redefine, or let's say advance our global commons thinking? Well, to begin with, it does have a journey of change from the Earth system science in the 70s, our ozone layer in the 80s, the Anthropocene proposed, already 2000 that was introduced, planetary boundaries in 2009, 
Sustainable Development Goals 2015. And now we then suggest that global commons must therefore be a key guiding principle for humanity to be able to deliver on the SDGs. We do, as, as we have proposed, advance the global commons to go beyond just systems outside of national jurisdictions to also be the large systems that regulates our ability to stay in a stable interglacial state. So biodiversity, biogeochemical cycles, critical biomes, cryosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere. So all that is in the paper. We define global commons in this way, as all the environmental systems that regulates the stability and resilience of the Earth system. So not only the systems that nobody owns and nobody cares for, but the systems that actually every individual, every household, every business depends on irrespective of where you are on our little planet, even though it's on the other side of the planet, but we depend on it because it regulates the stability of the Earth system. We have uh, suggested three principles for global commons in the Anthropocene. Principle one, perhaps the most dramatic, there are no more externalities. Everything is inclusive today. We must internalize all the values of natural capital and all our responsibility for the commons as an integral part of our development. Principle two, the universality principle, which is written into the SDGs today. There's no such thing as Annex One or Annex Two. We are all sitting on the same little planet and we all have the same responsibility as a global community. And principle three, the resilience principle, that we have come to the end of the road of thinking that optimization efficiencies and linearity can hold. We need to simply back off from thresholds and apply resilience thinking and invest in diversity to keep redundancy and keep away from tipping points. Major biomes are therefore critical, and uh, Sylvia Earle is here and others who have been defending biomes for decades. Well, now there's more support than ever that these systems regulate our ability to be prosperous in the future. These are not ethical responsibilities only. These are systems that depend. A finance minister in any country must recognize that these are internal to create jobs and create growth and create prosperity. And that is a very big shift in the global development paradigm. It actually means transformations. This is a, an effort of summarizing what the Paris Agreement means. It means you know, bending the curve of emissions latest 2020 in four years, a roller coaster down to a fossil fuel free world economy by mid of the century, maintaining in green and blue the negative sinks in all our natural ecosystems, so being sustainable stewards of oceans, lands, and forests, and having an agricultural system that goes to negative emissions by mid century in brown, and then even having to have biological carbon capture and storage in orange, and this still just gives us 66% of delivering on Paris. We're talking of a revolutionary transformation to a sustainable future, just to deliver Paris. And in doing so, we need a mind shift. This is how we define sustainable development in the Rio conference. I love Gruhal and Brundtlum, but this is something we actually must admit didn't work. It gave us a Mickey Mouse economy, meaning that the economy has been growing very well, yes indeed, at the expense of human capital and natural capital. And that the Mickey Mouse economy must now be transformed into an inclusive, integrated Earth system approach with planetary boundaries where the economy serves society and operates within a safe operating space. And we spent a lot of time yesterday in the scientific group to discuss for the planetary boundary systems what this really means for the discussion today. And you have the board right to the left here. In my mind, I won't go through this one in detail, but the center here is really fundamental. The scientific message is we need to recognize the interdependence between the biodiversity, the climate system, the oceans, the nitrogen phosphorus cycle, all the biogeophysical systems, and society and economics. And I personally love this arrow from biodiversity to interdependence, that we have so much evidence that even biodiversity today is fundamental to our success as societies. We went through a whole list of different candidates that work for today. I will certainly not go through these after having groups on biodiversity, forest, oceans, novel entities, biogeochemical cycles, water cycles, and climate system. But I'd like to highlight three ones. Global commons are associated with risk, conflict, and security. This is a key message today that we're not an, on an environmental journey. We're on a sustainable development journey outside of only protection. And the second one is we had discussions in every group on financial innovations, from green bonds to major carbon pricing to all the efforts of getting to scale on investments and getting momentum on the economy towards sustainable innovation. 
And third, we need a narrative. We need a narrative for this desired future for humanity. And we don't have it, and this is a very important, not least to create inspiration for a positive future. And one narrative is the world in 2050, which connects to this work, which is to attain the SDGs in 2030, but then have a transformation to a world where we stay within a safe operating space by 2050 within the global commons. We need to rethink even these wonderful 17 goals and recognize that we actually have a hierarchy among them where four of them, the water goal, the biodiversity goal, the ocean goal, and the climate goal are actually non-negotiables. These form the safe operating space of commons within which we as humanity can deliver on aspirational societal goals and the economy is methods to achieve this. And that this may be part of a new narrative, a narrative that can give us a good future for humanity. So in conclusion, in the Anthropocene, global commons are more important than ever. It's key for world future on Earth. Second message, we need to adapt global commons to the Anthropocene. We now clearly continue to include resources outside of national borders, but also all the system that regulates the stability and resilience of the Earth system. Global commons therefore include all the planetary boundaries. It implies there are no more externalities. Everything we do is internal to our own well-being and prosperity. This is a big change for economics. A stable and resilient Earth system is the common heritage of all humanity and every child's birthright. We stay with that old, very wise principle of global commons. Three principles, the inclusivity, universality, and resilience applies. We need disruptive transformations, and a mind shift is needed. And uh, someone yesterday suggested the following, that perhaps a part of that mind shift is this one, that the Mickey Mouse failure plus the wedding cake becomes reconnecting world development with global commons. Who knows, this might be the new story for humanity. Thank you.